Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has been a very interesting and challenging one on the book of Galatians. We're now ready for lesson number nine in that series for August 26 of 2017, entitled Paul's Pastoral Appeal. See if you can guess what that's talking about. I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to be looking at a number of verses. But we always, as always, would like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we consider the words of your friend Paul and his tremendous appeal to these people in Galatia not to go back to the terrible condition they were in before, but to continue to press forward with present truth. May we learn from them, um, may we learn from them the mistakes, that, not to do the mistakes that they did, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Galatians 4, 12 to 20, Paul uses, he actually changes his arguments. Up to this point in time, he has used a, a very theoretical, very solid scriptural, based on the Old Testament, what some would call an intellectual appeal to the Galatians. <clears throat> But in these verses, he turns to a very personal appeal. Let's just look at that. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, be like me. After all, I am like you. You have not done me any wrong. You remember why I preached the gospel to you for the first time. It was because I was ill. But even though my physical condition was a great trial to you, you did not despise or reject me. Instead, you received me as you would an angel from heaven. You received me uh, as you would Jesus, Christ Jesus. You were so happy. What has happened? I myself can say that you would have taken out your own eyes if you could and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those other people show a deep interest in you, but their intentions are not good. All I want is to separate you from me so that you will have the same interest in them as they have in you. Now it is good to have such a deep interest that the purpose is good. This is true always, and not merely when I'm with you. My dear children, once again, I just like a mother in childbirth, I feel the same kind of pain for you until Christ's nature is formed in you. How I wish I were with you now so that I could take a different attitude towards you. I am so worried about you. What kind of an appeal would you call that? Emotional. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> are you more attracted by carefully thought out, logical, truth-based arguments or by emotional appeals? That's a question each one of us has to kind of ask for our, answer for ourselves. We know that in, on many occasions in the past, uh, pastors have been very successful at bringing people to the gospel through emotional appeals and sometimes when you come back a year or so after they have an evangelistic campaign, you can't seem to find any of the fruits still left there. And that's one of the problems of emotional appeals because they never last very long. Well, I guess the first question we should ask is, should we as Christians use both types? Because now Paul has very carefully used his thought out logical arguments, and now he makes that, a, that personal emotional appeal. Is, is that the right approach? What do you think? Of course. Of course. Because Paul did it or because God inspired it? No, we were persuaded for both ways. I mean, even if you think about the logic to living, there's no real, if you're looking just at logic, there's no reason to live. Mm -hmm. But we keep living because in our heart we want to, and it's mm -hmm. our emotion mm -hmm. that wants to be that way. So there's there's motivations and there's reason at mm -hmm. the same time. Well, I want you to think about now, Paul is appealing to them to, to reject the arguments of the Judaizers. I want you to think about this for a moment. Why would these Judaizers probably come all the way from Jerusalem to northwestern, what we would call today Turkey, 
just to try to disrupt and, and disprove Paul's arguments, that he had worked so hard to convince these Christians to, to believe. Why would they do such a thing? Well, I think there's some prodding by evil forces, mm -hmm. for one thing. There's probably other reasons, but that would be one, I think. I think Presumably they, they were sincere in what they were doing, these Judaizers. I mean, that's what they believed in. Whether, as Gary says, whether it's maybe inspired by the devil or, uh, or their own which would, pride. Well, we know from Acts 15, verse 5, that there were a number of Christians who, who, who identified with the group of Christians who came from the group of the Pharisees. Do you think maybe some of these Judaizers were former Pharisees? I think they resented to a certain extent the fact that Paul was the leader. They wanted some of what he had. Yeah. Okay, there's a good possibility. It's also possible that, and, and remember the reaction after Paul and Barnabas, and this is, this is later, but after Paul and Barnabas' first trip out into, into Gal southern Galatia, out into Turkey, what we would call Turkey today, Asia Minor in those days, they came back and the Jews got really worried that Paul was being so successful at bringing Gentiles into the Christian church that pretty soon the Christian church is going to be bigger, I mean, the, the number of Gentiles in the Christian church is going to be more than the number of Jews, and they were desperately afraid that Christianity is going to lose its Jewish flavor. Maybe it was that, is it possible that that was part of the problem? I don't know. Good idea, good question. Well, uh, the people that came to town to Jerusalem uh, every so often, did that reduce the, what was Paul was having to say, did that reduce the membership or the uh, visitors to uh, Jerusalem? May it have an e economic impact, you think, on uh, Jerusalem? You mean, you mean people, people might have been decreasing their uh, offerings and yeah, sacrifices? And also, uh, yeah, I would, you know, might have some impact there. Yeah. Or was it that they just weren't getting more people? That's possible. Yeah, but the Galatians, they were, they were. They came out of paganism. They weren't Jewish. Yeah, but there so must there have been synagogues. There were, there were a fair number of Jews there because Paul was preaching to them in the synagogues. So, yeah. but I, but I think the predominance was probably pagan. Yeah, and Paul seems to be. I mean, the Judaizers seem to be preaching the message. Well, okay, you've learned something from Paul, but now if you want to be real saints. You're going to go all the way, and you're going to do all these extra things. You're going to get circumcised. You're going to do all these things. What kind of an appeal is that? Do we have any groups today that say, well, if you just believe us and just follow us, you can be super saints? <laughs> super saints? Well, call them what you like. I like the term super saints. Well, you know, if... if the groups have been running unicycles for all their life, and all of a sudden another guy comes up with a bicycle, and everybody starts doing the bicycles, well then the guys with the unicycles will get kind of concerned and probably go back to telling them, what are you doing this for? Yeah. You know, and they start losing their, their power because they're not riding their unicycles anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, this is true. Some, that, now you're making the assumption that it's primarily the former Jewish uh, Christians that Paul's appealing to, because you couldn't say that about the pagans. Uh, yeah, well, it's true. Yeah, you can that that'll work that way too, and it could be just Jews from Jews that aren't Christians, but normal Jews. Yeah, could be the same thing. Well, the Greek here in this passage has Paul literally begging down on his knees begging them, please don't make this mistake. And it's very interesting to notice and to remember, we need to constantly remember this, Paul was a former what? Pharisee. Pharisee. He says, I've been there, I know what that was like. Well, he's been there, done that, and mm -hmm. believe me, this is better. Why are you going back over there? I would never go back there. Exactly. You, had the, you asked the question, though, about an emotional appeal. Uh, 
Paul had worked with these people over a long period of time. And so it's not like the emotional appeal is coming out of a vacuum. Yeah. We got history here. We got he's worked with him. He's tried to teach them the gospel. He's tried to move them from old covenant thinking to new covenant thinking. Um, yeah. Well, we know that what Paul uses is in his emotional appeal is to uh, is to talk about the history of Abraham and Sarah, and of course Isaac and Hagar and Ishmael. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what kind of an appeal is that? How would you? Well, think about the story. Uh, what do we know? Abraham comes out of Ur of Chaldees. Now, our lesson suggests that that's way down in southern Iraq. I think there's m growing evidence that was not in southern Iraq. It was actually up in southeastern Turkey. There's a pl it's place there called Ur Fa, which is almost certainly, because if you read the statements about crossing the Euphrates and so forth, um, it's almost certainly it was he came from there. And, it, and that place is close to Haran or Haran, uh, where he stayed for some period of time and his father died there. But then he, he's following God's direction all the way down to the land of Canaan. He, he's going blindly. He's never been there before. And God says, Come down here, I'm gonna make a great nation out of you. Well, what do you have to do to have a great to be a great nation? Gotta have children. You have to have children, of course. Or converts. Or converts. Now, one of the things we need to remember is that Ellen White says that uh, Abraham was so successful in traveling through these different places that he convinced a lot of people of the truth about his religion so that he had a thousand people in his household. In fact, a thousand heads of households, apparently, that gathered at his place regularly to be instructed by him. I mean, we know that at one point in time, he went to find those kings that, that had conquered uh, Sodom, and he had 318 trained soldiers working for him, no doubt for trying to protect his flocks and so forth. But he had an enormous congregation of people that he was directing. Isn't that, you think that's because of converts, or you mm -hmm. think it's because of, I always thought it was because that's the way it happened. You would always have these big, towns moving along to, the, to support each other. Well, I mean, I suspect that they were converts. Oh, yeah, I, they I were mean, probably the, converts. The shepherds, the shepherds and the, even the military people and so forth, or whatever you want to call them, the, the gar, armed guards, etc., I suspect that they were, they were actually followers of Abraham's God. Well, Paul makes an interesting thing, before we get too deep into that part, Paul makes an interesting appeal that we need to, we need to look at just briefly. In several places in, in the writings, for example, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, be like me. I'm sorry, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But here in Galatians and in over in Acts 26, he says, be like me. Is there a difference between imitating me and being like me? Yes. Yes? What's the difference? Well, one, you're just acting. Mm -hmm. The other, you're being. You're it's a deeper level. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a deeper level of <clears throat> believing. Would you call that a paradigm shift? Probably in a lot of cases it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ellen White, uh, I'm sorry, this is, I'm sorry, this is from, uh, from our Bi Bible study guide. To be a follower of Christ is more than just the profession of faith. It involves a radical transformation into the likeness of Christ. Paul was not looking for a few minor alterations in the Galatians, but for such a transformation that to see them would be to see Christ. That was from a uh, material by Leon Morris. Um, so how should we appeal to our friends and neighbors and associates? How, how do we convince them that they, that they would like, that they need to be Christians? Is, we've already suggested, is, the idea that there are some solid biblical-based logical arguments and there are some emotional appeals and there's a possibility of a combination of the two? Um, well, I think we just described it in being versus acting mm -hmm. like. Day-to-day -day example of how yeah. we do. 
Mm -hmm. You are actually being what you preach. You're you're not just acting like it uh, when you're on stage. Okay. We believe that in our day there are some very difficult times ahead for Christians. They call them the seven last plagues and there were other things that were connected to the seven last plagues, but some difficult times. How many of the Christians that we know do you think would continue living exemplary Christian lives, even reaching out and appealing to others to become Christians if being a Christian meant a death sentence? You know, that's, that's kind of a judgment we'd have to make. Um, I don't know if we, we need to judge that. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not... I'm not asking you to label anybody. I'm just asking you a generic question. Well, it might be surprising either way. Yeah. Well, Ellen White suggests, as you know, that through the, 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 the uh, latter rain and at the same time the, uh, the scattering that's going to come about that same time, there's a lot of people going to leave the church and a lot of other people are going to come in. And I think we're going to be surprised at why some leave and why some come. She what, goes, what do you mean by church? Well, of when course. When you have the last days, are you going to have a church that you're going to be able to, to go Well, when we, we use church to re... Uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't. I sh shouldn't use it that way, but I use church to mean God's select group of people, uh, God's faithful people okay. at the end. Okay. Here's an interesting so comment. On, yeah. on that point of the seven last plagues, don't we have information that God is going to pr protect his people during that time and they'll actually be safer than the general population? Yes, that's true. It's going to look safer like it's going to look like like they're being persecuted. Well, and they probably will we, be persecuted, but they'll be safe uh, well, from death. Job was Job was preserved. Yeah. He was safe. Would you like to be like Job? No. <laughs> it's going to be the same kind of experience. Well, the, the reason why we don't come to that is because of the Egyptians and their plagues, because yeah. the Israelites were protected. Yeah. And so... What, what do you think of these words? This comes from Acts of the Apostles, page 510, paragraph 2. The unstudied, unconscious influence of a holy life is the most convincing sermon that can be given in favor of Christianity argument, even when unanswerable, may provoke only opposition. But a godly example has a power that it is impossible wholly to resist. How many people do we know like that? It's kind of hard to visualize that actually happening. I, theoretically, I know it can happen, but, well, but what, what are you actually saying when you say that? I'm saying if you were one of the twelve disciples and you watched Jesus, what would you see? Well, I saw a bunch of them wanting to be the greatest one. I saw a bunch yeah, of that's, I'm not asking what you would see <laughs> among them. I'm asking what you would see in Jesus. Oh, what you'd see in Jesus. Well, you were talking about influence, and that's why I gave you that answer. Yeah. Um, well, and, and look at that. I mean, let's, let's take your argument. It was a powerful enough argument so that every one of them except Judas was ready, ready to, when it was all over and they sort of realized what was really going on after the ascension and the Pentecost, every one of them was ready to lay down their lives because of their beliefs in Jesus. That's true. So? And all but one of them did. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty impressive. It's a really an unanswerable argument. When you talk about the people who want to dispute Christianity, there's no way to explain if, if you know, s supposedly the people have tried to say, well, this is a made-up story. They just got together and they, they sort of made this story up because they, did, they didn't want to look like a failure. And so they went around telling people, well, he really rose from the dead and so forth like this. I don't think you would die for, a, for something you knew was a lie. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm not, I'm not that committed to a lie. Um, well, in our day, there are many people who'd like to talk. Talk has become cheap. Words, even pictures, can fly around the world instantly via radio, television, or the Internet. 
We all are familiar with that. <clears throat> Should we take talkers seriously? Do we need to see their behavior see that their behavior matches their talk? Should the, li should the lives of politicians and talk show hosts be made public so we can compare their behavior with their claims and statements? I don't know whether any recent experiences might come to mind. So how do we actually influence people? I mean, we're, we're here trying to say something from Scripture and we're trying to influence people's thinking. How do we influence people? We're always influencing people. Okay. So how did Paul influence people? Mm -hmm. The two arguments that you that we talked about at the beginning was he did it based on scripture, number one, and then he finally turned to we might say emotion, mm -hmm. personal experience. Missiology is a very interesting subject, which of which I wish I were more familiar. It's a study of how the gospel is spread among unbelieving peoples, pagan peoples, people who have never been exposed to the truth that we know. And <clears throat> in the old days, my parents' times, or maybe even their parents' times, it was, a, it was almost assumed that to become a Christian, if a missionary went out, say to Africa or to India or someplace like that, to China, you would spread your European culture. And that was the same as spreading the gospel. We now know that that's not true. You do not have to behave. With, I mean, I still know about experiences of having spent many years in Africa. You come to a, a, a bush church out in the remote areas and there's nothing but a, a grass wall around it and a, maybe a thatched covering for the preacher, maybe the only th covering, and there's a bunch of people sitting on, on wooden benches or maybe sitting on the ground, and the preacher thinks he has to dress in a suit and tie. When it's humid and 105. Exactly. Exactly. Now, is that necessary? Well, let me ask you something. <clears throat> Would it be all right for a Christian to dress like a Muslim if he's working with Muslims? <coughs> I don't think they necessarily have to. If you look at what goes on today, what Muslims don't like in public, you're not supposed to drink, and Smoke. most of the Western society think nothing of it. That annoys them more than anything else. Yeah. Although behind the scenes, a lot of them do it. Yeah. So I think you've got to be careful with that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, when you go into a cathedral in Europe, women have to wear yeah. something on their shoulders, yeah. no sleeve, yeah. sleeveless. I mean, something on their head, depending yeah. upon what region it is. Yeah. 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 So, is there anything wrong with what, what missiologists would call contextualization? I don't see anything wrong with spreading the gospel wearing a Muslim outfit. Maybe I'm wrong. No, no you're not going to be drawing <clears throat> as much attention to yourself. I mean, by standing out by mm -hmm. wearing Western dress. Yeah. Well, Paul talks about obeying the law of Moses and obeying the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love. Love, okay, fair enough. Do we, when we, when we try to bring people into the church, are we more concerned about convincing them to be Christians or more concerned about convincing them to be Adventists? <laughs> Hopefully it's both, but it doesn't seem to always work out that way. <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. Depends whether you're more interested in the franchise or the, the truth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, some of you know one of, our, one of my teachers, and some of you had the same teacher many years ago here at Loma Linda, used to ask this question, which of the beliefs that you believe in would you be willing to die for? 
which are important, really important that you'd be willing to die for. I'll throw that question out to you in the audience out there. Which of the beliefs that you hold would you be willing to die for? I will tell you very quickly an incredible story. Um, a friend of mine, who in fact used to be my pastor, you, before he became a Christian or an Adventist, was a newspaper reporter. And one day he was called to report on a case. This is what happened in that case. Somebody showed up at a pastor's house and knocked on the door, midnight. And the pastor went to the door, opened the door, and the guy just immediately forced himself into the, what was the, the living room and put a gun in the pastor's face. And he said, <clears throat> wake up your family. I want them in the living room. I want them to see what I'm going to do. So the family, he, the family all call, he called them out, and they came out, and they stood lined up along the wall. And he said, now I'm going to ask you some questions. He turned to the pastor, I'm going to ask you some questions. Do you believe that, that there's a God? Do you believe in the second coming? Do you believe a few things like that, just standard Adventist kinds of beliefs? And when he got done, he asked him six or eight questions. And when he got done, he said, OK, now we're going to find out what you really believe. So he put his gun to his head like this. And he said, now I'm going to ask you the same questions. And the first time you say yes, I'm going to pull the trigger. And his family are standing over there watching. What would you do? What would I do? So he, this guy's putting a gun to his own head? No, no. The uh, guy is putting a gun to the oh. pastor's head. Okay. And he says, the first time you say yes, do you believe in God? If you say yes, I'm pulling the trigger. Say that he does demonstrate that he says yes. What good <laughs> is that? Well, this isn't the time to argue about that kind of stuff. The question well, is... Well, why not say no? No. No. But then as soon as he leaves, I take it all back. Yeah. Well, this is what actually happened. <laughs> he says, do you, believe, do you believe in God? And the pastor said, yes. And the guy took the gun and threw it across the room. He said, I didn't think there was anyone left in the world who really believed anything. And my newspaper friend came out to report this to, to the next morning. He was sent out by his newspaper to report this story. And as a result of a bunch of things also that happened I don't have time to talk about, he became an Adventist pastor. He was the newspaper reporter, not the pastor, not the, not the gunman, but the one who just came to report the story. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's not going to be an, an isolated experience. Those kinds of things are going to happen to us. Well, in light of that, are, are our Christian standards being subtly eroded? Do we still very faithfully guard the edges of the Sabbath? Do we, has our dress standards changed? Um, do we still hold the Bible study and prayer as as sacredly as we once did. Um, in the mega churches that are so popular among Christians now in many parts of the world, are people really converted to Christianity or is this just a, a local TV show lived out live with a, with a show up front? Can you tell? I'm just asking you to think about it. Um, so, if your idea is no, well, what does that tell you? And now, how would you arrive at the at no? It seems to me like there's an awful lot of uh, made-for-TV programs going you mean, on here. You mean just because you see it on TV that that it's probably not right or it's well, fake? You. You look, and, and the length of the program has to be fixed, and the certain number of the amount of time that each person is allowed to take is fixed, and so forth. And I, I don't think that's wrong, but after a while, you begin to think, okay. And some pastors will say, well, I, I can't talk about that because we're we're being TV, we're being televised. Then what do you say? 
think it's comparatively easy to hide in a big church. Yeah. Are you referring to our broadcast, the fixed length of time? <laughs> yeah, I don't. The fifty-six need to go. minutes or fifty-four minutes, whatever it is. Yeah. Well, are our lives being transformed by our relationship with Jesus Christ on a day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year basis? Would it be correct? And let me ask you out there: Would it be correct to say that if our picture of God has not changed over the last year, we are worshiping a graven image? Well, while you think about that, in this portion of the book of Galatians, Paul reminded them of their past experience together with him. It is impossible to tell from the evidence that we have available to us exactly what happened to Paul while he was among the Galatians, but apparently he suffered some kind of illness, and, and a lot of people, and I'm, I'm in one of them, who are inclined to think that in light of what he said, you know, you'd be willing to take out your eyes if you could and give them to me, suggests that maybe... Uh, Paul had some kind of an eye ailment. Whether this was a result of his experience on the Damascus Road, we have no way of knowing at this point in time. But it sounds like he had some kind of an eye ailment. And, he, and the Galatians apparently took him in and they were so kind and, 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 and treated him so well. Um, and now they seem to be rejecting him because of these Judaizers. We also need to remember that in Paul's day, if you suffered some serious disease, it was what was the reason? God sent it because you were evil. Or God bad. sent it on you either because your parents sinned or because you sinned, right? I have to go clear back to the book of Job, that yeah. kind of stuff. Look at your condition. You must be something wrong with you. you yeah, exactly. did something wrong. I mean, it's obvious, Pretty obvious, right? yeah. And then when Jesus came, he was dis despised and rejected of people. Must have... <clears throat> God must not be smiling on him, and yet he was. Does, does God allow Christians to suffer, and if so, why? Well, you got Paul, you got Peter, you got all the other disciples, you got Jesus, mm -hmm. you got John the Baptist. How many more do you want? Well, and, and, <clears throat> and let's, ask this, let's ask this question, like, like Paul. If the day comes, sometime soon maybe, that it's against the law to worship on Sabbath, would you be out going from door to door and telling people they need to worship on Sabbath? I mean, isn't that basically what Paul's doing? I mean, it, he was, what he was doing was against the law. It was his, his what, Christianity was an illegal religion. And he ends to end up paying, paying with his life. And Daniel didn't compromise. No, Daniel didn't compromise. Well, uh, he, Sure, it's a compromising, or is it just that there's nothing else except for Christ? And um, so it isn't really a it isn't really a a tension for him at all because there's nowhere else to go except for Christ for him because he's decided that and he's he has all kinds of reasons for that. Does God ever use adversity, even sickness, persecution, poverty? as a means of cutting away sins from our lives, distractions. He could use anything. Would well, you, are you saying that God causes these things or he allows them to happen? Take your choice. <laughs> I'd bring more to the, mm -hmm. uh, that he allows things to happen, but he, God is also our protector. Mm -hmm. as, and I don't think God needs to do anything overt to, to in a negative, harmful way. But, I mean, people will do bad things to other people. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need to do bad things to any people to get anybody's attention. It's very interesting to see that uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic in Africa is leading a lot of people to take a religion much more seriously than they did before. Is that a blessing? Well, I remember 9-11, the church is all filled up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was for about right. six or seven days. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, it soon got over it. I, I'm always amazed, and I've mentioned this before in our studies together. Um, you know, in public media, you know, we believe in evolution, and we talk about 
the ancestors or our ancestors who lived here billions of years ago or millions of years ago or whatever it is and so forth like this. But then a disaster happens and let's pray to God. God needs to do something. What are we going to do? And I always tell them, hold on a minute. Do we believe in God or don't we believe in God? <laughs> it was interesting to note on the news the effect that the morning news had on those guys that got shot. Yeah. It changed a few people's outlook in Congress, which surprised me. And the one or two that I heard, I thought, whoa. Now, whether it'll last is another question. Yeah. It may be getting kind of close to home with some of those people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they realize how vulnerable we all are, mm -hmm. among other things. Well, Paul asks in Galatians four sixteen to 20, he says, I'm very worried about you. He says, could I by telling you the truth become your enemies? Is that possible? Does speaking the truth scare people? Well, what did uh, Jesus say to a pilot? He said, I came to bear witness to, to the truth. And what did he do? It got him a death sentence. Well, yeah. The net result ended up yeah. that, you know, I mean, uh, he had a spineless... Uh, Pilate, yeah, basically said, I'm washing my hands of this whole deal. What is truth, too? Yeah. There's another comment in that. There, remember, there was a, a movie years ago that says, you can't handle the truth. Yeah. Uh, maybe you may have seen a commercial for that years ago. But a lot of peop people don't want to deal with truth because it... A lot of people want the truth to be a certain way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and the more you convince them that that is not the way, the angrier they get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when Satan came down as an angry person. He's, it's exactly what happened. <clears throat> Sometimes it's very difficult to speak the truth, um, to, to dismiss an employee who obviously just isn't doing their job. It's not easy. What about misbehaving Christians? We continually baptize people into the church here in our mega church that we belong to. How many people do you know that have been disfellowshipped recently? I think there should be more. I'm sure there's no sinners in our church. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, Ellen White says this. She described Jesus like this. He did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved that refused to receive him the way, the truth, and the life. They rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness and sorrow so deep that it broke his heart. Every soul was precious in his eyes. While he always bore himself with, with divine dignity, he bowed with tenderest regard to every member of the family of God. And we think about his treatment of the woman taken in adultery and other people like that. And all men he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. Desire of Ages, page 353, paragraph 1. Could we do that? What does it sound like to have tears in your voice? Is that obvious or not so obvious? Well, it's some sort of discipline that isn't, doesn't show any anger, but it's very tough discipline. On one occasion, Jesus spoke to the Jewish leaders, to the Sanhedrin themselves. What do you think of his words to them? I'm going to read some in just a moment. Was that an emotional appeal? Was there, this a time when Jesus had tears in his voice? Here, here are the words. I'm going to read to you just one verse, John 8, 44. This is part of a long discourse he had with them. And he had already built up, he's near the end of it, and he says, you are of your father the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Does that sound, could you, could you say that with tears in your voice? 
I think Christ had the gift of adjusting. He had quite a few gifts. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is he could adjust it to the time. The common man of his day were attracted to him mm -hmm. because he was genuine. He wasn't a hypocrite getting around in mm -hmm. purple robes and all this stuff, but when he had to really face up to it, he knew where to push the arrow. Yeah. He didn't have to pound on the pulpit to get his no. point across. No, no, no. He and, and the most impressive part of, of his ministry was his life backed up everything he said. That's right. So getting back to Galatians now, when this a letter arrived from Paul, sent from Corinth to Galatia, we don't know, someone probably carried it by hand. How do you think it was understood the first time they read it? Someone stood up. Most people couldn't read in those days. Someone had to stand up, unroll the scroll, and read this letter. Now, in Galatia, there were probably, you know, Galatia is an area, a whole area. It's not a city or a town. So if there were a number of different Christian groups there, how do you suppose this, hey, we got a letter from Paul. What does it say? How would you summarize in a few words what Paul said in the book of Galatians? <clears throat> Wait, we'll read it to you next yeah. week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or we'll read it to you right now. Yeah. How should we react if we see error creeping into the church? Is it easy just to be spectators? Or should we get involved? Dr. Maxwell, some of you remember him, uh, used to talk about riding on the Adventist bus. And when the bus gets a flat tire, do we get out and help fix it, or we just sit and complain? <laughs> got any sense, you get out and help fix it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, error. Um, there's all kinds of flavors of that. Some of it probably takes um, attacking quickly and other things take some patience. Mm -hmm. So maybe people hang more on the patience all the time when there should be a, a direct attack. But Well, here's a question that we, every Adventist family with children has to ask themselves. Is it easier for a child to stand up for what he believes if he's among people that obviously don't agree with his beliefs? Or is it easier to stand up for his beliefs if he's among a bunch of people who are supposed to believe the same as he does, but maybe are compromising? Good question. Do you, do you think that it's not possible unless the parents are doing, doing the um, standing up too? Well, I mean, that's a separate issue, but that's obviously very much related. And these are, these are, these are ch tough questions. Do you think Paul's appeal to the Galatians was successful? For some. First time? For some. Oh, for some. Oh, I'm sorry. For some. Okay. So... If Paul made an appeal to, uh, I think about his, his letter to the Corinthians, he told him to throw some people out of the church. So if uh, not everybody accepted his letter to the Galatians, do you think the rest of the Galatian churches, ch church members, were, were they, did, they, did they throw out the Judaizers? You could see some difference between those two. Um, not necessarily they're the same, mm -hmm. but they could be the same, like you're saying. But uh, I would question that first. Are those two exactly the same? Well, w w Ellen White suggests, and I absolutely agree, and, and, and I think reading Galatians and Romans at the same time, I mean, reading them together and realizing how much they're similar, if we read the story correctly, Paul had written four letters from Ephesus to the Corinthians. And he, 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 he made an appeal first, 
Then he made a longer appeal, which we call First Corinthians. Then he, he, he apparently made a, a brief visit there, probably traveled by boat across from Ephesus to Corinth. And they, they rebuked him to his face, and they were very nasty to him. And he went back to Ephesus, and he sat down, and he wrote a nasty letter. I shouldn't say nasty letter, a very firm letter on, in favor of the gospel. And he talked about his own personal experiences, etc. And then and having then he sent that letter with one of his friends who traveled all the way around to Corinth. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and there was no response. And it wasn't like you get on your email and tell them what happened. So he started, he got so worried, he decided he better start out to see what, what, what had happened to the church at Corinth. And he traveled all the way around. He got clear over to Philippi somewhere, maybe even to Macedonia, somewhere over there. And finally, he met Titus who said, they accepted your letter and they're willing to reform. Then Paul went down to Corinth, spent the winter down there, and it was at that point where he wrote Romans and Galatians. So that experience was very fresh in his mind when he was writing this. Well, let's talk about how all this might apply to us. We're going to look at two or three quotations from Ellen White. I want you to think about these. Talking about the people who are living just at the end of this world's history, Ellen White says, they can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must stand, understand the will of God as revealed in His Word they can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. Now let's stop there for a second. She's basically saying you need to know God if you're going to survive, right? To know his character, his government, his purposes, you better know him really well. Well, John 17, 3, that's yeah. eternal life. Yeah. Then she makes this incredible statement, but none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test, should I obey God rather than men? And what's going to be the searching test part? Are our lives going to be threatened? Are we going to be thrown into prison? Are we going to be... She goes on to say the decisive hour is even now at hand. At our, are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? That's Great Controversy, page 593, in that fantastic chapter entitled, The Scripture is a Safeguard. Well, she doesn't stop there. A little bit later she says, But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds of dis or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, would that include the general conference? Hmm. As numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, and its support. The ecclesiastical council, does that include the Council of Nicaea? It includes a lot of councils in the past. Um, I think we could see... doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means they shouldn't be our ultimate authority. I think we're going to see more of that in the last days. I mean, it's all geared up there. And we, I, th I think we all know who we're talking about. And even uh, what we're seeing going on around us is opening to this. There's going to come a time. It can be church councils. It can be legal. All kinds of ways they're going to do it. Yeah. Well, we shouldn't be surprised at what she says next. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads the people who look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology as their guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then, by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes 
according to his will. That's Great Controversy 595, paragraph 2. How many of us depend on what some leader says or someone has taught us and say, well, it must be right because so-and-so says so. Do we, do we check it out? Do we... I mean, these aren't easy, aren't e easy questions. We need to. I think yeah. you, you touched on it a little earlier. It should be a religion based on quiet evidence from Scripture. Mm -hmm. It nails it right there. Yeah. Well, then she goes on a couple pages later and really goes to the ultimate extreme. It is the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the Scriptures what is truth and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. Walk in the truth and encourage others to follow whose example? Christ's example. Is that talking about Christ or is it talking about their personal example? Both. The lack of capitalization suggests that it's follow the person's example who is following Christ. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1? Imitate me as I imitate, imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So if we were really committed to imitating Christ, would it be okay for us to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ? Well, that's what he says in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but the life I live now, I live by the life of the Son of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're living that life, it should be safe mm -hmm. to be an example. So would it be okay to say, imitate me as I imitate Paul, as he imitates Christ, as he imitates God? Well, How long does the chain get? <laughs> if you need to, that's fine. We should day by day, she goes on, Study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought and comparing Scripture with Scripture. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves, as we are to answer for ourselves before God. Hmm, there could be a lot of opinions there. Okay. So, how many opinions? But what's the are criteria? You have? What's the criteria for the opinion? Based on Scripture. It has to be based on Scripture. Okay, but your basing on Scripture may be different than my basing on Scripture. Well, but, uh, and I agree with that, I agree with that, but I, I would say, remember that uh, if we take the Jesus approach, he was humble, teachable, that's what we need to be. So, the way we avoid mistakes under those circumstances is say, this is what I understand Scripture is like, now what do you understand? How do you read this passage? What do you think? What do you think? Let's share together and collectively we'll come to the right conclusion. I believe that the Holy Spirit, God, will guide us. That, that's what's supposed to happen. I'm not saying that's what does happen. I'm saying that's what's supposed to happen. But does it need to happen? It needs to happen. Do you think so? Mm -hmm. So how does this, all this relate to the emotional appeals we were talking about? Are emotional appeals commonly used in evangelism? And should they be? They are, whether they should be or not is the issue. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, I'm reading Ellen White again, an hour, a day, but of a lifetime. It is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly dying to sin and constantly living for Christ. Wrongs cannot be righted by, nor reformations wrought in the character by feeble, intermittent efforts. It is only by long, persevering effort, sore discipline, and stern conflict that we shall overcome. We know not, we know not one day how strong will be our conflict the next. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome, so long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. Acts of the Apostles, page 560s. Well, she goes on. Others, and actually it's a separate passage, separate quote. 
Others fall into a more dangerous error. They are governed by impulse. Their sympathies are stirred and they regard this flight of feeling as an evidence that they are accepted by God and are converted. But the principles of their life are not changed. The evidences of a genuine work of grace on the heart are to be found not in feeling, but in the life. By their fruits, Christ declared, ye shall know them, Matthew 7, 16 and 20. That's found in Evangelism, page 286, going on to 287. A lot of people are only moved by emotional appeals. Do you think uh, a world that's flocking to the movies are inclined to be moved by emotional appeals? Well, would, would you, if you went to movies? I mean, isn't that, isn't that what gets a huge, I mean, what makes a movie really popular? It, it grabs people. Well, it's not popular with you. Well, I, thank goodness. Thank goodness? So everybody needs to be like you. Well, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I was just putting that yeah. out there. Just I mean, <laughs> you know, in that respect, maybe it would be a good thing. Okay. He, if Paul can the say it, you can say it. <laughs> the movie houses would go out of business pretty quick. <laughs> well, um, it might lead some people to join the church. Is that a bad thing? But if so, then there's a much harder job must be undertaken to get people to study the Bible carefully over a long period of time, preferably with friends, so that they can have a deep, settled commitment to the truth. How well are we doing at helping all of our church members in doing that? When someone comes into the church for the first time, we stick our arms around and say, Oh, bless the Lord, you've joined the third angel's message, and then we say bye, or, or do we? There are methods on your website, theox.org, that are, have lots of Bible study material for every book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Questions. questions that people need to, need to struggle with. A lot of people have never even thought of those questions that are included in those study guides. And I would challenge you, go to our website at theox, that's T-H-U-X dot O-R-G, and, and look at some of those study guides. Pick a book in the Bible that you like to read and see if you've thought of all the questions that are there. It's a challenge to you. That brings our program to a conclusion. Thank you for joining us. Our kind and loving Father, as we, we struggle with some of these really challenging questions, that we need to think about as we approach the end of this world's history. May we make the right choices. May we make the right decisions in our own personal lives as each day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.